Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to present our next speaker for today's seminar, Professor Nikola Rakotsi from the University of Bologna. It's our great pleasure that Nikola Rakotsi agreed to deliver a lecture at our seminar. Thank you, Professor, and please go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I plan to be an attendee of your seminar in the, uh, in the future. Uh, so this talk is about uh, uh, the Dirichlet space on the by disk and uh, some notions of biparameter potential theory. Then I'll talk about it later. And it's a work in collaboration with Fabio Mottogliaco from uh, Saint Petersburg State University. Can you see the? Can you see? I can't see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Saint Petersburg University and uh, Carmita Perfect and Trondheim and Giulia Sarfatti, who is in Ancona. And the work is going to appear soon in discrete analysis. Uh, and then from the name of the journal, uh, you can guess that the holomorphic thing uh, will disappear very soon. Uh, the, the holo <clears throat> that there is some discrete analysis uh, involved uh, in this picture. So let me make some story, uh, a, bit, a bit of a I mean, some highlights in the story of Carlson measures. Uh, so Carlson measures. Measures uh, for a Hilbert a function. Hilbert space uh, on some on some x, okay. Colors of measures, okay, these are measures. Uh, so if I have a, a function Hilbert space, uh, let's call it hx, okay, uh, which is defined on uh, some uh, basis space x, a measure mu on x Is Carlson if it satisfies an inequality like um, f squared the mu is bounded by a constant which depends on mu times uh, the norm of f in that space. Uh, so, of course, uh, x must have some structure to support measures like a topological space. So uh, let's say some examples when, uh, okay, let's pick X, the unit disk, right? And uh, consider H X, H is equal to H2, the hard space, hard space, <coughs> holomorphic, right? I don't know if I have to give a definition here, but let me first state a theorem. Uh, so the theorem says uh, <clears throat> this is Carlson about 1960, maybe 1959, uh, <clears throat> saying that uh, the constant you put here is about the supremum of uh, uh, the measure of S of I, now we say what is S of I, over the length of I. Uh, and the, here is the picture. So if I am in the unit disk, I am in the unit disk, and this is some R of I, and then I consider a region uh, whose depth is pretty much uh, Let's say an angle, like okay, so that this is the same as that, and this is called S of I. It's a Carlson box. So my Carlson box. Okay, uh, and let me mention that if you consider the Dirichlet, the, uh, okay, if you consider the hard space on the by disk. By disk is just the product of two disks, uh, which you can think of a, 
in abstract terms, like a tensor product uh, of this uh, with itself. Uh, the characterization of Carlson measures um, Carlson measures are not known. Um, and here there is a bit of a story, uh, which is a, if, if I consider the uh, <coughs> There is not a characterization like this of measures so satisfying this condition. Uh, a bit of a story, it is that in 1979, Alice Cheng uh, considered the harmonic, the harmonic version of the hard space and the bad disk. And she came with a condition uh, she came with a condition that uh, that was this one, uh, that the best constant, maybe I should leave this here for a future reference, uh, that the best constant, okay, you can put here, uh, looks a bit like Carlos measure on the by disk, which means, uh, but not too much. Uh, <clears throat> so she saw that <clears throat> mu for the harmonic for the space is comparable to the supremum. And here you have to take uh, the uh, measure of unions. of rectangles over uh, the measure of that. OK, uh, where well, these are disjoint, and I will make a picture. Uh, <clears throat> OK, um, where n is greater or equal than 1, and these i i's uh, and j i's uh, are arcs uh, on the boundary of d, uh, which means this time you have two copies uh, of the unit disk. And for each copy, so you have two copies of the unit disk. And for each copy, you consider i i's. And you consider boxes, and then uh, j i's, and you consider boxes. These have to be disjoint. And here, of course, I forgot to put some s over there. And then, <clears throat> okay, you pick the product of these guys, uh, which are possibly many. Let's say i1, j1, i2, j2. And <clears throat> OK, and then you form the measure of the product of these and of these and so on and so on. And you compare with the uh, area, uh, with the area thinking of this as a uh, segment. Uh, uh, why do we have the unions instead of a simple box? Well, that's because Carlson, 1974, Said that if you just consider one box, does not work, is does not suffice. Very very clever proof. Not very easy to write, but fortunately Terry Tao uh, wrote uh, a, like a, a version of the proof for pedestrians that you can find online. Uh, okay, now the passage from uh, H2 harmonic. Uh, to H2 holomorphics, it seemed that it was in a paper by Lacey Ferguson on ACTA, I think 2000 and uh, maybe two, 
but unfortunately, there is a gap in this paper. Uh, there is a gap which is not fixable. The, 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 the gap was found by uh, Alexander Wolberg. Uh, so basically, uh, we don't know. We, we know that this condition is, uh, of course, holomorphic, implies harmonic. So this condition is uh, the condition that this is finite is uh, uh, sufficient for a measure to be Carlson, but we don't know if it is necessary. And that's about the hard space. What, what, what about the Dirichlet space? Uh, for the Dirichlet space, uh, let me say first what is the norm. I will leave this um, picture on the blackboard. Uh, the norm on the unit disk. Uh, so Let's call it, OK, it's defined by this norm. Uh, so the Dirichlet norm is like, uh, there are many versions of that. Um, let me put here, I can put a positive constant if I want. Uh, but the main part is uh, a conformal invariant with respect to area measure uh, on the disk. This is conformal invariant because if I apply, uh, if I change uh, the coordinates on the unit disk conformally, this quantity is preserved uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons is that this is the uh, area of f of d counting multiplicities. Okay, so suppose, okay, we have this Hilbert space of functions and we want to characterize measures mu. So that, satisfying this inequality and to have some quantitative information on that thing, on that uh, constant. So Stegenga in 1980 came up with this characterization. Uh, says that mu, so the best constant I can put over here, it is comparable uh, to the supremum uh, of. And here we have um, the union uh, of Carlson boxes, measure of that, over the capacity of the union of the sides uh, for all and greater equal than one, and for and for all uh, disjoint uh, one i n. Uh, let me correct the picture. So that means that we need uh, i one, i two, blah blah. Okay, let's put this with two, and we have to measure these two boxes with some the measure. Well, two, three, four, one hundred boxes with some measures, and then we divide uh, by the capacity of this uh, boundary set. Okay. Uh, there are other characterizations uh, which are not as nice, uh, I think. And I was one of the people proving them, uh, so. I don't say this lightly. Uh, this is a really wonderful characterization. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, the problem is that what, what is capacity, right? Uh, I mean, which capacity are we talking about? Uh, so, the boundary of the disk, okay, I can just consider it as the segment zero one, but like uh, maybe in a periodic fashion. Uh, and suppose I have uh, a subset E in zero one, possibly the union of segments. Uh, okay, the capacity I'm talking about here, it is the logarithmic capacity, which is a uh, logarithmic capacity in uh, is like the logarithm of, of the transfinite diameter. Uh, I know some people put the logarithm, some other don't, but uh, it's like the Bessel 
So the capacity is like the Bessel one half derivative in L2, which corresponds to uh, I consider the uh, so capacity of E is the infimum of the L2 norms of a function uh, on the zero one, so that uh, well, phi is greater or equal than zero, and then the Bessel potential. Well, here we are in a compact. Uh, uh, thing, uh, the Bessel potential computed at a point, which is the integral of uh, uh, phi of y, x minus y to the power one half dy, uh, is greater or equal than one on the set E. Okay. And that's, uh, the, the, this is a uh, comparable, uh, at least, to logarithmic capacity. And there are many equivalent definitions. I mean, many definitions which are equivalent for small e's. And that's uh, the number which appears, uh, the quantity which appears uh, over there. So uh, and now let's get to, the, to today's object. And today's object is uh, the Dirichlet space uh, I want to leave that here. Okay. Uh, the Dirichlet space uh, on the by disk. Uh, so for the by disk. But uh, let me mention that uh, Chang's proof of the theorem is pretty much like look in that page of Stein's singular integral and differentiable properties of functions. And in that page, I think you find an exercise. And you solve the exercise, and then you have the proof of uh, the characterization of the Carlson measures. Uh, so it's not that hard. Uh, so in this case, uh, the Dirichlet space on the by disk is, by definition, say, two copies, the tensor product of two copies of the Dirichlet space on the disk. Uh, if you want. Uh, it, that means that when you consider the norm of f here, the main term, it is a double integral of the derivative with respect to z, and then with respect to w, it's like a wave operator in a sense, um, area, area, plus lower terms. Okay. Typically, there are four terms. Uh, there is one involving derivative with respect to z, and one uh, derivative with respect to w, and one uh, no derivatives. OK. Uh, and what is the theorem? So the theorem uh, it is that in this case, the that quantity over there, well, I I could have copied the uh, Stegenga's characterization. Uh, it is the supremum of the measures uh, of uh, union of I uh, over the capacity of the unions of these rectangles. Well, what is this capacity? Right? So that's uh, today's theorem. And in fact, the paper is uh, the paper. I'm presenting is uh, 60 pages long almost. And virtually all of the 60 pages are devoted to the proof of this theorem. Uh, maybe a couple of pages in application to multipliers, but uh, it's basically it's due, they're used to prove this. Uh, OK, so this capacity is a 
it is the tensor product of capacities, meaning that the capacity of I times J, uh, well, let's say, let's put it a two here. Uh, it is the old capacity of this times the old capacity of J, right? But of course, we know that capacities do not be, uh, you know, they, they are not uh, additive, not even close to be additive. So the fact that we have the unions here, it is a big problem. Uh, but if you want to, to get the definition, it's like the capacity uh, of E, where E is a subset of the square, which is subset of the square is the product of two copies of the boundary uh, of the unit disk, which is a shield of boundary of the by disk, as it's called, uh, or distinguished boundary. OK, so this capacity is like the uh, infimum of the norm of the functions phi, phi, which depends this time on two variables, and two, uh, so that uh, when I consider the integral, and here I have uh, f of, uh, let's say, x is equal to x1, x2, so I don't have to write so much, uh, f <clears throat> of y over, and here I put the product of two copies uh, so I put uh, x1 minus y1, the one half times uh, x2 minus y2, the one half y2. Uh, so is the infimum of this? Oh, I forgot conditions. Uh, phi greater or equal than zero, uh, and uh, this greater that's a phi greater or equal than one on E. OK. So, uh, OK. How do we go about proving uh, this theorem? Uh, and what are the main difficulties? Uh, so the main difficulty, I mean, the way of proving this theorem, so it's the Gengar's proof. Uh, was uh, <clears throat> the strategy is pretty much the same. So let's call this integral like k of phi at x, like potential phi at uh, x. So uh, what? So the strategy is this one. Uh, it is tip, uh, and it was first used by Mazia around 1960, and then uh, there are some uh, uh, novelties for fractional things and so on by Adams uh, a bit later. Uh, and the strategy is uh, first show a um, strong capacitor inequality. Inequality, which I'm going to write, uh, show a strong capacitor inequality. And then you have this here, like in a standard way. Standard means that after Mazian in 1960 proved the first theorem and other people copied the proof in different contexts, if you have this strong capacity and quality, you do, do prove the theorem. Uh, maybe it takes more pages, less pages, but it's. Um... So, what is a strong capacity and quality? Strong capacity and quality, we have this potential, right? Uh, we have this potential k phi is equal. Uh, integral of uh, uh, some kernel uh, where this kernel, it is something on the disk, something on the by disk, and so on and so on. Uh, strong capacity inequality means that uh, <clears throat> you want to show uh, that the measure, uh, the, the The integral 
between uh, zero and plus infinity of the capacity of the set uh, where the potential of the function is greater or equal than t dt square like that uh, it is bounded by a constant times uh, the L2 norm of that. Okay. So that's the strong capacitor and quality. Uh, and Masia proved one of them, and Adams proved others, and other people proved others. Uh, how do we prove this? OK, I, I'm not going through the proof, but. Uh, with this kernel, because it's a bit uh, some pages, uh, but basically what you need a maximum principle. Or a weak maximum principle. Well, you, you need, uh, you use them, typically. Use a maximum principle. This maximum principle says that uh, if a mu is a measure, and if you consider k mu of x, uh, which is like the integral of uh, kxy the mu of y, uh, then uh, the supremum of k mu as x belongs to your space, r, r, n, the unit disk, the, the, whatever you're working, uh, is bounded by a constant times the supremum of this, um, where should I put an x? The supremum of this, uh, where this belongs to the support uh, of mu. So it means that the potential of a measure is bigger on the support of the measure. That's not surprising at all, because uh, think, uh, you know, if, if these potentials uh, uh, come from electrostatic uh, and your measure is a distribution of charge and there is a potential, of course, uh, the potential is maximized on the support of the charge. That's what you really expect uh, you know you, you go very far from the charge and the potential is low and uh, you're safe now uh, the point is that this is false in the biparameter world so the point this fails in the biparameter world, uh, which means, uh, I give you a statement. I will, I will not write the, ex the, 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 the example, uh, but um, maybe I will draw a picture later. This fails uh, because uh, um, you can find there exists a subset in the square uh, such that mu e, mu e, which is not only a measure, but even you can uh, pick it, take it to be uh, the equilibrium measure, equilibrium measure of E, and this set E is not strange. It's, it's like a you know, de very decent set, uh, fails this, uh, satisfies um, the fact that K mu, the, the soup over the square, of k mu uh, is very large, say 
uh, is one, greater or equal than one, uh, and the soup on the on E, or even on the support of the measure, well, E is the support of the measure of K mu uh, is less or equal than epsilon, where you can choose any epsilon you want. And uh, we didn't work with this, but I think that you, if you play around with these sets, you, you can even get uh, zero here, but that's not. So there is no maximum principle, no maximum principle. And what is the way to go around it? And this is really due to the biparameter uh, nature of the problem. And the way to go around is to prove, and this is what about 70% of the paper is about, a, a kind of weak or a substitute. Maximum things. What is the substitute maximum principle? Uh, let me get the exact um, uh, statement. Okay, uh, it is like this. Consider uh, E lambda. Okay. So consider mu equilibrium measure. Consider E lambda for lambda bigger the one, but we need just gamma large. E lambda as a, the set of the axes so that uh, the potential of mu at x is greater or equal than, uh, here I put something different, but uh, lambda. Okay. So I consider, you know, uh, this is my set E, and then uh, I fix one, and then I go to see uh, what are the, the, you know, and then there is the potential, which is maybe a bit high here, maybe a bit low there. Well, potential, if it is the equilibrium potential, it is one here, one. And then for lambda bigger than zero, I go to see if there is some, uh, some bad set where this is bigger than zero. Okay, so consider that. Then the capacity of E lambda is uh, bounded capacity of E lambda times lambda square. This is a renormalization thing. It is less or equal than some constant. Uh, times um, the uh, capacity of uh, uh, times the, the, the I mean this is what is called the energy it is the energy of the measure for this potential theory in electrostatics is really like the energy, uh, over lambda. That's the thing. So, okay. So if you consider this inequality without this over lambda, this is tautological. It's simply by rescaling you get that. But there is a gain, okay, so this is the gain. So this is the gain. Uh, so essentially, your set controls, well, the, the, this capa the capacity of this set goes to zero as lambda goes to infinity. So it's a small, this. And with this substitute maximum principle, you can play one of the proofs of the strong capacitor inequality, and you prove the strong capacitor inequality. Strong 
che pezzi per il mio codice Um, okay. Let me say something about the strategy uh, of this proof. Uh, so the strategy of this proof is this one. It is a First, first I want to read this. I want to. Uh, I read this. This says uh, that the uh, okay, Carlson. Well, let's say this. Okay. okay. So Carlson. This is very general. That means that we have uh, uh, from H X H X embeds. Identity in L2 of mu is bound. But this is the same as uh, saying that the adjoint of the identity is bounded from here to here. So let's call it theta is bounded. From here to here, and this uh, you can compute uh, because you can compute if H X uh, has a, a reproducing kernel. Uh, which means that to, to each X uh, we associate. Uh, some function so that the value of any element at x can be uh, written as uh, the inner product of that in our space. Okay. Uh, then you see very easily that this is the same as asking that uh, the uh, I don't know if to find the symbol uh, to say that. Uh, <clears throat> well, surely, okay, you can compute first. Uh, this theta, of course, depends on the mu, which is here. Theta mu uh, of a function here, let's say it's phi. Phi is not a holomorphic function. Say these are holomorphic functions, and these are functions without structure. This is a function without structure which becomes a function with a structure, and uh, you can compute it explicitly, uh, because this is the integral uh, of the reproducing kernel. And I might be wrong uh, with the, maybe I need a, maybe I need a hyx, uh, but th that's not really in the view of y. Okay. And then uh, using the beta functional analysis or a TT star argument and so on, uh, you can say that this is equivalent to have uh, uh, that this operator uh, maps uh, L2 into uh, L2 mu. So if and only if. Uh, you define the operator t, t mu of phi, uh, as uh, the integral. And here, you only have the real part of x, if you want. The real part, that's nice, uh, times phi of y, the mu of y. Uh, so if and only if that maps uh, L2 of mu into L2 of mu. So 
your problem, your original problem by functional analysis becomes a problem about this uh, integral operator and where you have a weight. And so and you want to, to know for which mu. Okay. Uh, and now, in the last 10 minutes, I tried to convince you that this uh, leads to some uh, discretization uh, business, because, okay, so this is first part of the strategy. I want to characterize mu so that this, is, uh, this operator is bounded. The second part, well, first, we are not in any space. We are just in the Dirichlet space. So the Dirichlet space has a reproducing kernel. So in the Dirichlet space, the reproducing kernel is, a, well, remember, I put a constant C plus the logarithm 1 over 1 minus uh, Z bar W, and uh, on, uh, maybe I should put it H, and if I consider two copies, tensor product of this, well, then I have the product of two things like that. So I get uh, C plus log 1 over 1 minus z1, c plus log 1 minus 1 minus z2, w2. Well, we all know that the real part of the product is the real part of the sectors. Of course, that's not true. Uh, but what is true, it is that the real part of H, say, Z1, uh, well, Z, Z, W, it is comparable uh, to the real part of, this is my age on the disk, to the usual age, and here there must be a W, uh, Z1, W1 times the real part W2, 1. So the real part of the product is the, if C is large enough, for C, large enough, I think that 10 is okay. Okay. Uh, right. So first, in this operator TMU, the kernel is written like a product of two positive, and these, both these two things are positive. So that means first that, well, also in general, so we have a positive operator, TMU has a positive kernel, kernel, and uh, we test it, um, So, uh, <clears throat> okay, so what's the meaning of these numbers over there? Uh, the meaning of this number in geometric terms uh, is, um, is this one. So, okay, but for a few exceptional points, I am in unit this. And then I have some points Z and W. And I consider the so-called hyperbolic, okay, here, the zero, uh, the hyperbolic geodesic, so a unique circle which is perpendicular to that. And then I consider this one. Okay, let, let's come with this point, Z wedge W. Okay. So, when I consider H Z W, the real part, This is pretty much like one plus the hyperbolic distance uh, between uh, that 
and that. Uh, right. Hyperbolic distance, it means that you measure it uh, like, um, like this. Uh, but uh, it means that uh, hyperbolic distance, it, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the first one has comes one, uh, one fourth comes one, one eighth comes one, and so on and so on. It gets smaller and smaller, and then you get close to the boundary. And the segment of length one over two to the n counts one in this hyperbolic uh, metric. That uh, right. What do we do with that? Uh, what we do with that? It is uh, that we consider a picture. Uh, which is very common. Well, first, okay, this is the unit disk. Uh, let's put the unit disk. Uh, okay, this is the boundary of the unit disk. And say we, we put it in polar coordinates that's zero. Uh, this is like uh, that r e to the i t. Uh, so here we put p over pi, and here we put one minus r. Uh, so uh, we start. We pick a big ball and <clears throat> center at the origin, then we split in two, then we do something like that. And so on, so on. And this picture you make, if you like trees, uh, that looks like a binary tree. And so on. And then you do this. Uh, then you do. Uh, you consider, okay, these three is for the T. Anyhow, uh, so you have your three. And so on. In this three, you have a point Z here. And then you have a point down over there. And then you, and this is the root place, the role of the origin. And now you consider the geodesic going from here to here, the tree. The shortest path is this one. Well, this is called Z wedge down. Now, you, and this is like a hyperbolic baby version of the, of, uh, you know, of Lomachevsky geometry. And you would like to say that the number of steps going from here to here, which is like the tree distance. Uh, from um, the root to Z which w, you would like to say that it is comparable to this uh, hyperbolic, uh, to the real part of uh, H W. Well, possibly, uh, why not? A plus one is already here because there's a big one. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to put the one plus here. Well, that's false. That's false because uh, two points Z and W here are very close in the disk, uh, but they are very far when you consider them in three. So let me put uh, some other tweezers to say that this is just like uh, a metaphor. Uh, but actually, it's more than a metaphor. It's more than a metaphor, and uh, I guess. Uh, I'll close it here uh, because, uh, oops, yes. Uh, I just take one more minute uh, to say that <clears throat> you can reduce So in the one dimensional thing, you can reduce this to a problem problem on the tree. And when you are uh, on tensor products, these two things, you can reduce to a problem on a by tree.
And just to give you a feeling, it's that um, I mean, this tree, the tree, you just have zero one. And when you have zero one, uh, your points are just dynamic um, intervals. And when you are in by three, you are here. And so your points are dynamic rectangles. And then you run into this problem because if you have two dyadic intervals, either one contain the other or they are disjoint. Well, that fails miserably. Uh, so you don't have covering theorems, you don't have maximum functions, it makes you a long list of things you do not have uh, when you are in debate three. So the situation is simpler, but uh, you have a lot of problems. And I stop here. Uh, sorry for taking some minutes more, and thanks you for your attention. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, Alexey, probably you will continue. Yeah, please, well, please go ahead. Thank you for the very interesting talk. If there are questions, please. Maybe I have small question. If I'm sure. Okay. Uh, actually, we discussed with you a month ago so many questions uh, related to the BDISC, and in particular, I remember that we had a discussion about the different norms in each particular disk. But I understand this is kind of uh, problem for the future. But maybe just small sub-problem that I would like to ask you. Do you somehow use the over decomposition in your study uh, whether you use some particular weights that are radial weights or maybe radial constructions that may simplify your theory and calculations at some point. Thanks for the question. Okay, if the weights are radial, I expect things to be much, much simpler. Uh, I mean, it, 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 you, you mean it, it, the question is that if the measure mu is radial, right? Yes, uh, whether it's, it simplifies the picture, whether or not. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. uh, and that's the reason. Uh, the reason is that, okay, I said a measure on the unities, uh, on the unities, but really, when you do calculations uh, here in divide 3, we, we push things to the, the measure mu, we push it to a slightly different measure here. Uh, so really, we are just working on the boundary or on the shear of boundary. Uh, and the measures here are as complicated as the radial version. So unfortunately, I'm afraid uh, that the analysis is not. Uh, I'm afraid that the main difficulty is to remain the same. The, the difficulty is this picture here. You don't have covering theorems. You don't have. That's it. Yeah. You don't have harmonic analysis to play around. <laughs> so. Okay. Maybe some more questions. But it's not. From my balance point, I cannot see hands of participants. I'm not from my computer, but from my violin. It's hard to see uh, whether there are questions or not. 
Well, it seems to be not the case. So well, maybe I continue my question with uh, uh, also just one wondering. Understand that using polar decomposition in this theory is not fruitful. I mean, it's not doesn't help, right? So you really decomposition. The polar decomposition in the unidisc. No, polar decomposition here doesn't help. No, the, there sure. are... Uh, uh, I mean, basically, the problems here are of a combinatorial nature, somehow. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can introduce to the calculus of one-dimensional calculus, like using just decomposition in one variable and another variable. Yeah, I understand. No, that, that's... Uh, uh, let me just mention, I, I said it by this, dimension two. Uh, and then uh, Pavel, Jakob, Wolberg, uh, and uh, another couple of guys, they did the, the try this. Try this. So you, uh, you have two, you have three, then you have everything. No, the four disk is still open. Uh, because the problem becomes combinatorially more and more complicated. And, uh, and somehow, the, 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 we are waiting. You yes, you, you, you see the reason why I'm fixing on this uh, polar decomposition because it's not the only coordinate in the unidisc. There are three types of coordinates in the unidisc uh, elliptic, the polar decomposition, and hyperbolic and parabolic. And for the other two types, you can go to the plane, to the upper half plane. And in this sense, I wonder whether it makes sense instead of considering the disk. Uh, consider this times half plane, but maybe it's not. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, it, it does make sense. Actually, it, it uh, actually my, 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 my intuition, I'm starting to work with some other guys, Pavel and uh, Chernubis. Uh, my basic intuition is that since we work with this, I mean, this is like the wave operator, right? After the change of variables. Uh, Okay, instead of the, you take two copies of, of the half plane, uh, and then we should get some result about the wave operator. We should get some result about the wave operator this way. Uh, so, if, but, if I understand you correctly, that it does make sense when you have, have on one side union disk, on another, another side uh, half plane, yeah. right? Okay, for, for the methods, we use uh, combinatorics of the same. Okay. I mean, combinatorics are no easier. Uh, instead of getting 0, 1 times 0, 1, you get 0, 1 times R, you get a strip. You get a strip, and then you get dyadic rectangles in a strip. Uh, yeah. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, I see. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the question, though. It's uh, inspiring for. <laughs> well, Vladislav, maybe more questions. Tatiana, if there are hands. No hands. Okay. So, Vladislav. Uh, so, let us thank our speaker. Yes, uh, let us send the speaker. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for the invitation. And uh, well, now that we're done with the seminar, will be the next next one. Will be as an attendee, participant. <laughs>